Okay, so a warm welcome to today's webinar from the Doctorate Hub, which is about stop speaking through the literature, engaging in critical analysis. And this webinar is given by me. I'm Dr. Andreas Meisner, and I'm a co-founder and mentor at the Doctorate Hub and have been working with doctoral students for the past 10 years. And we hope that today the general learning outcome is for you to know how to identify and build on current best practice as identified in the set of thesis excerpts that we will be exploring through this webinar. And more specifically, to understand that the difference between summarizing and reporting where this critical and analysis is very significant and for you to assess where you are in your own writing and in your own critical engagement with the literature and to provide you with the tools for doing so. And to provide you also with an overview that shows that old and less skilled writing is often sitting next to new and shiny writing, including within your own um, thesis, very likely. And for you to learn how to read the literature with a problem and not a solution focus, to practice how to draw on and compare evidence and data, and not only conclusions, and also to see what's the difference in between. And finally, to understand how to critically reflect on and how to challenge conclusions that are put forward in the literature. Now, if subsequent to the webinar, you're looking for further training opportunities, we do have an advanced training course on critical analysis and drawing on the literature. It's an eight weeks course, uh, free for self-study. So take a look and uh, make yourself familiar with the topic. And if you need even further training, we also have workshop formats on one-on-one -on -one or group-based. So take a look also at these. With this, today's webinar will make extensive use of unpublished writings and published writings and notably from publicly available thesis repositories. So we will look into clear practical cases. And with this, we hope to outline a bit best practice, but also something, some of the work that has potential to be further improved. Now, with this, let's start. First point, understanding the difference in between summarizing and reporting on the one side and critical analysis on the other side. Now, as a colleague of mine put it very nicely, doctoral students are often told by their supervisors that their work needs to move from description to analysis. But what does it mean? So have you just wasted your time in all of the descriptive writings that you have been doing? In short, no. The good news is that most analyses, whether it is of numbers, words, or images, starts with description. So basically, you provide context information, you detail what you are reading, what you understand, all of the stuff that's of a different nature that comes first in the writing process. And so summarizing and reporting is the start of critical analysis. So, excuse me for that. I'm fighting a bit with a cough today. So let's check what is the difference in between initial versus advanced writing. Now, initial writing, definitions are setting your narrative. If you look into this case here, you will see the word, the very word defining and define in the subheatings. So this is something normal. And then if you look into the argument, then you see that the main purpose of this section is to pro provide you with a working definition. Now, if I, as a supervisor, read this, then it's clear to me this is early writing because the purpose never should be of the section to provide a working definition. Now, what you do here is you provide that mainly for yourself and for others like your supervisor to discuss with you. So if you look into the second example, there you can see there's an advancement, which means you put in an evalu evaluative statement, which goes, this definition is suitable for. So you go one step further than in the first example, but telling me, the reader, what you want to do with that definition and what do you want to do with the construct, 
which here is a construct learning material. So you are not only providing the definition with the motive of that being the outcome in itself, but you do it for a comparative reason to after what start the analysis process. So this is already an advanced step to the step before. And if you compare descriptive writing with critical analytical writing, then on the, long, uh, on the left side, you will see words like states, states what happens, states what something, gives, says, explains. So this is all that you are doing once you are engaging in descriptive writing, which, and which can have two motives, one for you to make sense of where you are, and the other is to provide the required baseline information, context information, from which to build the argument further. Now, if you go into critical analytical writing, then the motivation is something more advanced. You want to identify things, you want to evaluate something, you want to argue, you want to compare. So this is a significant difference in advancement and both of the sides, descriptive writing and critical analytical writing go hand in hand. And likewise, you as an ongoing author of your thesis, there's also quite a telling on where you are. Are you still more on the descriptive side? In which case, a lot of times students adapt the messenger as being the narrative. Author A was saying that apples are good. Author B said, however, that too many apples are not good. Therefore, both authors disagree. So the focus here is very much on the messenger. This as much as descriptive writing is a clear indicator of still being a more initial writing phase. While once you move ahead and get more critical, you move the focus and the narrative towards the object of analysis that you are looking at. In this example here, in addition to this, there might be also economic barriers, such as required initial investment or the capability and willingness to invest that can play a crucial role and so forth. So you can see the narrative has been moved into the economic barriers, which has become the focal point of the discussion. And then some arguments are put forward, like the initial investment, the capability and willingness to invest, and so forth. And then the discussion focuses exactly on those initially established keywords and continues here in this case with regards to these there also appears to be a preference of short-term gains compared to long times as well as a preference. So you keep the focus really on the object of analysis and you dig into it and you compare things. So this is a clear advancement and going beyond descriptive writing. Are there any questions to that point? Okay. So now, I think it was quite easy to demonstrate for the examples that we've been looking at, what is the difference? But once it comes to your own writing, how do you find out where are you in your writing and what is your level of critical engagement with literature? Now, as a matter of fact, you can evaluate that relatively easily because descriptive writing by its very nature is easy, quick, and it often is generic, it often lacks evidence. I mean, it can be specific, but it often is not. And it often lacks references. If you look into this example provided here, then you see this definition suggests that human behavior refers to how someone, so you are just describing what you take from other literature sources, and then you do not do much with it. You continue in your argument saying here, from this perspective, the term behavior in the context of energy related behaviors might thus be understood as. So, again, this definition thus is only considering. So, you just provide definitions. So, how do you test that for your own work? You might just take your recent writing and use a search function from whatever text editor you have and check for the words definition, defines, or the author says. Everything that can be seen as just reporting. 
And as more often as you see those words and find those words, as greater is the likelihood that your writing is still at an initial stage. Now, in the ideal case, in, in the late version of a thesis, you will find close to zero times words like definition defines or the author says, right? Because you refined your work to such an extent that it's entirely focused on the object of analysis, also plural, therefore, right? Another word or search word may be according to, and that's right. in effect what a um, author states. Exactly, according to some something different, or it is important. Just the phrase in itself, it is important. Yeah, why is it important? To whom is it important? Important to what? If that's not within the subsequent sentence or within the same sentence, likelihood is great. This was just initial writing that was important to you. And that's fair and fine because this is how we enter into our research area. We need to gain knowledge. We as a researcher need to get knowledge of it. Therefore, it's important to us, but it might not be important to the research that we afterwards start to conducting. Now, we just looked into how to evaluate that you are at an initial stage. So how can you see that you are already advancing into what's more critical analysis? So let's look into this example here. And as again, a general term of advice, critical analysis is painful, it is slow, and it's specific. So it easily can be that you spend on an A4 paper a day or two or three, right? Why is that? Because it's evidence-based writing and it uses references. And if you use reference, then likely you need to read literature. So let's look into this argument that's put forward here, which is already slightly more critical. Energy-saving behaviors can be distinguished between efficiency and curtailment behaviors. So you look at two cases. Efficiency behaviors are infrequent, so you detail the characteristics of one. Curtailment behaviors, in contrary, are those, so you compare now. Each of these two groups require different level of investment on time, money, or individual effort. So now in this statement, you combine the first part of the writing, efficiency and curtailment behaviors, and connect it to levels of investment, time, money, or in vitro. And afterwards, you connect it to application case. In this case, for example, to insulate one's loft requires the time to look for an adequate supplier to hire. So you come now in with examples. So this is a critical analytical example. It's very concrete. It works over comparison of data sets, and it does it for a clear motive and purpose, right? Now, again, how can you test for your own work where you are? Again, look for the search function on your text editor and then try to check for words like contrary. However, despite anything that shows argument or disagreement, perhaps. If you have a lot of that in your work, that's a good signal that you have moved from just descriptive writing towards critical analytical writing. Does it make sense until this point in time or are there any questions? Okay. Now, let's move into the third part. There will be old and less skilled writing sitting next to new and shiny writing. And this is inevitable unless you would restart writing your thesis at the very end from scratch. And even then, if you rewrite 100, 200, 300 pages, presumably you will learn on how to write better, more precise. And then again, the first pages or the middle part might be less mature than other parts of your thesis. So this is a natural thing that is happening. And it's in particular happening to a doctoral level thesis. If you write a journal article, you will fine tune it until the point where it's almost all at the same standard, right? Not comparable to a doctoral level thesis, which comes together over a time frame of three to eight years. And no one will expect you 
to rewrite everything at the end. So it's inevitable that there will be some parts that are less shiny and other parts that ideally will be more advanced. And a lot of times, the initial parts still fulfill a purpose. While they are just summarizing, they are setting the scene. Now let's look into this example here, is summary that telling us how things work. Significance of seam and qualitative content and semantic analysis. Seam is a main product of data analysis that yields practical results in the field of study. The definition, similarities and differences of qualitative content analysis and so forth and so forth. So what you see here is someone telling how qualitative analysis works. And while it's summarizing in nature, it provides perhaps a required grounding for what is now to come, right? And you can, compared to the initial slides we were showing, you can still see that while this part here is summarizing, it's summarizing at a much higher and advanced level than the initial part, because you just don't provide definitions, but you do it here with a purpose and motivation. Now, next to summarizing, we have the reporting part. Let's look into this example, which is a description of a process, process of a construction phase. Briefly, in this phase of data analysis, researchers reflect on the process of organizing codes and compare them in terms of similarities and differences to assign a place to each cluster of code in relation to the research question. Considering the rule of, so this is a clear reporting on how a research process, a well-defined part of a research process is working. So again, it's not critical analytical writing, but it has a clear purpose of why it is in that thesis, because it has a function. It provides an overview of a research process in accordance to a literature source, hopefully, which is not mentioned here, to then be applied within the thesis either in that way or in an amended way. Now, moving one part further, here we see a contrasting view of a topic, which we now will read through. Qualitative methods are widely used in learning and teaching research and scholarship. While the epistemologies and theoretical assumptions can be unfamiliar and sometimes challenging to those from, for example, science and engineering backgrounds, there's a wide appreciation of the value of these methods. There are many often excellent texts and research on qualitative approaches. However, these tend to focus on assumptions, design and data collection rather than the analysis process per se. More and more, it is recognized that clear guidance is needed on the practical aspects of how to do qualitative analysis. As novel Norris White and Mould explains, the lack of focus on rigorous and relevant thematic analysis has implications in terms of the credibility of research process. This article offers a practical guide. So you contrast views, you bring together different schools, you acknowledge earlier work, you compare one field of study to other fields of study, which in this case are science and engineering backgrounds. So all of that is showing a good level of criticality once it becomes to describing the research methods applied. Yeah? And which builds nicely on the earlier slide where we saw the reporting example, which we're just looking into process-related information. So it's complementing each other. So summarizing reporting and critical analytical writing can go together very well and be built into a consistent narrative, right? So every time a supervisor or someone else asks you to move beyond just descriptive writing, understand what is meant with that. It doesn't mean you're expected to give up everything that's just summarizing and reporting. It just means that you should focus also on the critical analytical writing part in itself, perhaps first and afterwards to use the more summative and reporting styles as a complementary base to fuel into the critical analytical writing. Now, 
a fourth example here where we see how writing changes over time. Now, this early example is still from one of my thesis drafts back then. And let's look into that. However, Lacani and von Hippel point out that these three motivations do not suffice to explain the motivation to perform mundane but necessary task in FLOS, which has nothing to do with dental hygienic, but free libre open source software, an acronym for that, such as providing field support, which is provision of help to people having problems with the open source product. Kellogg as referred to in, so this is not showing a good example for reporting writing, but it's also showing a very bad example on what not to do. And we will look into that later again. And what shouldn't you do? As referred to, right? If you haven't looked into the original source, don't use that writing. You do not know what stands in the original source, right? Or how the others that have looked into the original source have have, have evaluated what they have been reading there. And I see a hand up, Randolph. Oh, yes. Please come forward. Hello. Hello. So just to see that I am understanding correctly. So it, it, it seems, so uh, I, do, I do see the point that um, the, the first step while we are engaging with the literature, so we start by summarizing the concepts now and reporting on them sort of, and then we move on to critical analytical writing. But can we have in the same, in a thesis, in a dissertation, in a dissertation, um, in a PhD dissertation, is it okay to have the first part of the chapter maybe, um, or, of the, or of the section where there is a tendency to be a little bit towards summarizing and then moving towards critical analytical thinking, or should, or should it be all, all throughout critical analytical writing. Um, so this, this needs a balanced answer. Now, I think we, we first need to understand that you do not write up a thesis chapter after chapter, page after page, right? I mean, you will start with chapter one and then move to chapter two. But what happens then in practice is you might have a bit of writing in chapter four, which is where you present already some analytics. And then you move back into the chapter three, where you provide a bit more on the methodologies. And then once you make sense out of what you have been doing, you might move back into chapter one. Ideally, you should be doing so because changes that you do in chapter three, where you will work on the methodology, will also need to be reflected on in chapter one. Or changes in the research question as they are presented in chapter two and three would also need to be reflected in chapter one. So bottom line is, while you might start very descriptive in chapter one, in your first iteration, two years down the road, in the 15th iteration of the first chapter, means you have been working 15 times or more through this first chapter, you should have minimized by that point in the research journey, the descriptive elements and replaced them against perhaps in the introduction chapter, more reporting and only very tiny parts which are critical analytic like the problem statement or the bottom line of what is the research doing and why hasn't that been done. So initial parts might be very descriptive, but if after year two or in a more final part of the thesis, still descriptive writing is dominant, then something might have gone wrong, if that makes sense. Yes, yes. So ideally, you should have exactly like you see here, the yellow, blue, and greenish, summarizing, reporting, critical analyzing that should be really nicely balanced in your first chapter, in your second chapter, in your third chapter, as more as you progress with your thesis. No one expects you at the start 
to have that nicely in place. It's quite clear at the start, most of the stuff you're reading, you read for yourself. That's the main target audience, you. You need to get knowledge in your area. And it's not uncommon that out of the, I don't know, let's take a hundred pages of student notes, perhaps only two pages make it in the introduction chapter. And the other part was just for you to understand what is it all about. And that's perfectly fine as long as it's fine with you. A lot of times a student is to him or herself the biggest enemy because they did all of that work and it's hard to let go, right? I mean, it was with me like that. I had there 200 badly written pages and I didn't want to let go of them. And what did my supervisor do? He said, okay, fine, keep them, just fix the grammar mistakes. Now that was a mean trick he played with me because fixing grammar mistakes over 200 pages is a lot, a lot of effort. So suddenly it became much easier to let go. So I deleted within a week out of those 200 pages, I don't know, 150, and only the others are reworked, right? So you can do the same trick to yourself. Does it answer the question? Yes, yes, thanks. And, and another thing, it seems to me that, um, two main components, two main characteristics of critical um, analytical writing is that they have, it has very few, if any, direct quotes. Most of it is, is paraphrasing. And the voice of the, of the author is, is really strong. No, did I get that right? Yes, with regards to the first. With regards to the second, well, the word, the, the, the author itself, whether you give the author an active voice or a passive voice, I, I think what's from a research student perspective, always easier and better to control is if you keep the narrative on the object of analysis and not on authors, right? If you want to research why is a roof broken, then you have two words that drive the narrative, the roof, and broken. Whether it was Andreas investigating that topic or Jacqueline investigating it or whatever methodology we applied, that is secondary. And by doing so, it allows you to very easily see when are you going off topic. Mm -hmm. Am I still using the two words, roof and broken? No, I don't. I now talk about Andreas and doors. How did I end up here? Why am I here? So from a student perspective and from a learning perspective, I think this is something if you want to keep you on yourself, if you want to be kept on the safe side and want to control yourself, are you on the safe side? Keep the narrative and focus on the object of analytics. What are you looking at? Thanks, thanks. What I meant by the author was myself, myself as the author of the of, of the thesis. Yes, if you should give yourself a strong narrative, you asked, right? Yes. So, and exactly to that, my answer is bluntly no. And the reason okay. for that is, if you start talking about yourself, um, I give you an example what often then can happen. Um, you could see that students, oops, sorry for that, that students start saying, I then looked into the case. I went into the room. I thought this might not be okay. I wondered if looking at that, I then realized. So you, you are just telling me what you're thinking, right? And you can do so in hundreds of pages very quickly. And a lot of times that's what's happening. Students do just that. They just provide process related information. If that makes sense. Yes, yes, yes. Thanks a lot. And as a matter of fact, that's often where students go wrong. Um, and the tricky thing here is, it is a valid way of doing research. First person narrative is, is very well established in some research disciplines. But 
it is extremely difficult for you as a research novice to make sure you're still focusing on the broken roof. If you always talk about I, I looked at the broken roof. I did not understand why the roof is broken. So I wondered, and usually there you go off. You talk about everything else because that's easy to do. If you force yourself to look at the broken roof, you likely will pause as a first reaction and think what's happening here. And you think. And at the end of the day, you have one page written. But this page is great because the thinking of one day is in that page rather than the telling of what you think is in 50 pages at the end of the day. Yes. Thanks a lot. Welcome. Um, further questions down that line? There's nothing in the comment field or the chat field. Okay. So let's look into that fourth example, how that changed over time. And as a matter of fact, the changes as you see them here, I, I think I have thousands of versions of just my very own thesis, as much as I have hundreds of versions from my students. So each version shows improvement, usually improvement, in the one or the other part. By times, obviously, research goes the wrong way, and then you need to revert. But expect, exactly as initially said, that old writing will continue sitting next to new writing. And this is perfectly normal. As you see here, only a small part, the blue part, from the old writing remained, which then was complemented with new writing parts, which are more critical in nature. And also some mistakes will be fixed over time. So this is also important. Make sure that you understand where did you do which type of changes in your thesis. Now, as a supervisor, a running joke is perhaps once you see a draft with the name draft final. And afterwards comes draft final two, draft final three. Draft final three, 2010. Draft final three, 2011. There's no such thing as final. Um, so consider using a versioning of your thesis that allows you to quickly find on which day were you writing on which parts. Yeah, that can turn out to be very useful in the long run. So with this, let's move into the next part. Are there any questions still on the third part? On the triple of summarizing, reporting, critical analysis, and how they can go together? Good. Then let's look into some very crucial part on which you will find a lot of webinars just dedicated to this topic how to read the literature with a problem and not a solution focus. Now, problem-focused literature review example. Do the test and check if your writing has a clear problem focus. Now, in this example, just look at the yellow highlighted words in itself, and you will see that likelihood is great that you talk here about some problems. You talk about limited capacities, about varying, about a finitive pool of vary about near-term threats, greater urgency, future problems, threats, worries, concerns, everything that's dark. Everything that you do not want in your personal life. You want to wake up on a shiny, sunny day, have a great lunch with nice people, good conversations, lovely walk, everything must be perfect. Now, research is the other way around. Something doesn't work. And we need to figure out why, what is it and why. So we look at the dark side of all matters. And if you see that in the writings without even reading it, it can reassure you that the researcher is looking on the right things. Obviously, you also should read it. Now, a problem focus means to look at what is not working, what is broken, what is unwanted, 
what is limiting all things that you won't like them to be exactly so looking for those terms limited capacity finite to pool near term threats can reassure that you have a problem focus in place contrary if you don't see any of those terms then the likelihood exists that you might not be on the right side and we will see how that can lead to very different research pathways now we start here with a case which is context according to the university mission statement the university seeks to provide students with a safe healthy learning environment dormitories are one important aspect of that learning environment why because 55 percent of the students life in campus is spent in them so the problem statement the student dorms currently do not have air conditioning units and during the hot seasons, it is common for room temperatures to exceed 80 degrees Fahrenheit. Many students report that they are unable to do homework in their dorm rooms. Others report having problems sleeping because of the humidity and temperature. The rooms are unhealthy and inhibiting students productive. So this is a clear negative case that's constructed here. Now you can ask two questions from that case. A solution focused or a problem focused research question. Now, the solution-focused research question is, how can we make the dorms more hospitable? And the problem-focused research question is, one of the possibles, why are there no air conditionings in dorms in the first instance? Now, let's look how the research purpose looks very different depending on the research question. In the solution-focused case, the research purpose is, in response to this problem, our study proposes to investigate several options for making the dorms more hospitable. We plan to carry out an all-inclusive participatory investigation into options for purchasing air conditioners, university-funded, student-subsidized, and different types of air conditioning. We will also consider less expensive ways to mitigate some or all of the problems noted above. Now, the funny thing here is, where are above problems noted? at least not in the research purpose. In the problem statement, yes. But then, what do you do if you look into that? What's the motivation? It's not clear, right? Not spelled out. So, now, if you look into the problem focused, then the research purpose becomes, in response to this problem, our study proposes to investigate why there are no air conditionings in the dorms. We plan to carry out an all-inclusive participatory investigation to understand why no air conditionings have been installed thus far. We will investigate if the non-existence is due to economic, regulatory, budget, technical, or other unknown reasons. Now, not only are you trying here to figure out why are there no air conditionings, but you also bring in a set of parameters that you will be looking at like economic, regulatory, budget, technical, and other unknown factors. So research will go a very different way down. Sorry for that. And consequently, the research outcome will be a very different one. <laughs> If you work over the solution end, you work over random guesses. So it's unclear what you get out of the research. While if you work over the problem end, you will gain knowledge on the different fields of study that you're looking in, economic, technical, whatever barriers that you will examine. And you will get deeper knowledge and reasons why have there been barriers towards purchasing air conditioning? So if you work over the solution end, you gamble for a solution and you take a shot funding in this case, what to look at. If you work over the problem end, you first want to understand why aren't there any air conditionings in the first instance. So you can start over the solution end, one can argue, if you have a deep problem understanding. Now evaluate for yourself. Do you have a deep problem understanding? And notably based on the research literature, if the answer is yes, you can adopt a very different research approach 
then if the answer is no, and your first research objective would need to be to generate this type of knowledge about the problem, literature-based knowledge, that is. Does it make sense? Any questions on this end? There's nothing in the chat. Right, okay. So, fifth part, practice how to draw and compare on evidence and data and not only on conclusions. And this is something that can be frequently seen even with advanced students, that a lot of times you directly draw on the conclusions, but not on the evidence. So what is it to draw on evidence? Now, if you look into this example, then evidence in this argument is once I talk about the author's talk about three different things, the one thing, uh, anything related to treatment, treatment efficacy, treatment outcomes, and treatment success and criterion thereof. Then they talk about offending and reoffending, and they talk about conviction and reconviction. And these are the parameters and criteria that are looked into and how they do belong to each other. Now, this is a evidence-based argument being built up. And if you work over that way, then the likelihood is reduced that you will just pick up on conclusions because you need to compare things and comparing just conclusions uh, will shut down your argument quite quickly. Now, let's look into... Once I remember my childhood, I'm a German, so we would call that silent post game. Uh, uh, it's common in kindergarten and primary school. We call it Chinese whispers. So that's the UK and Australian way of work or calling that game. Um, but the outcome is the self, right? Hearing saying uh, is changing things quite quickly and quite fundamentally. And if we are in science, then we always should make sure we look at evidence because even once we look at the same piece of evidence, the likelihood of interpreting things differently is real, right? So if we want to stand the slightest chance of engaging into an evidence-based argument, we need to be as precise as possible and we need to look into original sources. Why? Because conclusions are made in a context and they are used by other researchers in other contexts. And now you want to use them within your context. So three different types already where things can go wrong. So therefore, please use data and evidence as much as you can and refrain from just working over solutions. You still can work over solutions. And so far, as you try to find related works that also found out something similar to what you think you have in your front. That's okay. So then working over solutions is a starting point. But once you identified related research, then latest the time has come to look into the evidence base and see what has there been analyzed and looked at and compare that with what you're doing in your case. If that does make sense. So, and with this, you should be able to tell how have the conclusions been reached? You should know under what conditions they have been reached. You also should understand how plausible the arguments are. So how well does the data support the different arguments? And what are the different arguments anyway? Are there any? Right? So one thing that goes a bit back to this earlier question that Randolph had, on is it okay if the introduction chapter is having more descriptive writing? Yes and no, understand research is an iterative process. So therefore, conclusions are taken at the end. Yes, but the research is having likewise a very inter iterative nature and it's also front and back, right? You collect data, you reach initial conclusions, you go back to the literature, chapter two, that 
provides you then with a different line of thought, different analysis, you reframe the research question, chapter one. Uh, this changes the refer research purpose, chapter one and three, uh, which then alters the analytics, chapter four or five. So while conclusions come at the end, understand there is that fluid nature of research, the going front and backward, yeah? So as long as your research process is robust, including acknowledgement that you had to go backwards and revisiting the research question, that you had to go backwards to the literature review, all of that is something that should be well documented, either only in your brain or ideally also in written. And by having that documented, you will be in an excellent position to defend your research work later in the viva. Right, because you know exactly what changed, and there's no fake in your see this. It is as it is. It's research. Things are understood at each point in the time, better or less good, and therefore things change. And that's absolutely fine. No one will tell you, but you wrote in the introduction, you do this, and now you're at the analysis chapter and you did that. If that happens, then you didn't adapt it your thesis good enough. Right. So, and so the meaning of end is relative. Your thesis will still need a good deal of work to reach the end of the thesis. Right. You will be revisiting research question, fine tune the literature review chapter, adapting the narrative, completing, updating the introduction chapter, writing the abstract, which is usually the last thing that comes. Right, and then getting ready to the viva and explain how all of that came together. Any questions at this point? Nothing in the comments. Yet. Now we come to the final point. Understand how to critically reflect on and how to challenge conclusions put forward in the literature. We will look at three examples a basic one, an advanced one, and a very advanced one, and then see how those researchers put together their argument, how did they work with the literature. We start with this example from the University of Cumbria, which goes, Brown 2005 maintains that leadership is an essential quality in nursing. This is confirmed by the recent requirements of the NHS plan, 2002, this plan has emphasized the importance of introducing the transformational model of leadership. Smith 2001 explains that this is a leadership which involves the use of charisma and interpersonal skills to enable achievement. Jones 2004 argues that the key characteristic of transformational leadership is empowering others to achieve. In my own experience, a leader with transformational qualities can make any team member feel that they have a useful part to play in the organization. This is confirmed by FIA 2001, who argues that transformational leadership increases feelings of self-worth and capability in the team members. Now, question to the group, is this a good argument? And what do you think is good in that argument? Can you tell any reactions? It's a bit of a lightweight argument, right? Um, it presents literature, it's a yellow part, but it doesn't really engage with it. Um, then it brings in, in my own experience. Now, what's it worth, your own experience, and why does it matter? Do you provide own evidence through own observation? Then please bring them in. And again, perhaps. As Randolph asked, can I put myself into the first person? Yes. And the risk of doing so is exactly this. In my own experience, 
And the student perhaps even thought he is doing a great job here, but he's not because it's unclear why that matters. And even worse, now, I wonder how fear a researcher who likely is not living together with a researcher who was writing that text could conclude in his or her research in 2001, the own experience of the author. What the author wants to say likely here is that the evidence base is the same or comparative in accordance to the view of the researcher, right? But this is all tested. It's not showing while it should be the core part of the argument, right? To me, clear example of lightweight writing, usually to be seen at the early part in the research and clearly not past level for doctoral work. Good. So, and you can go to the university, there you will see a balanced evaluation of that case. Is this piece an example of good academic writing? Yes, the style is formal and flows. Paraphrasing is used to introduce evidence from the literature. How well does it use literature to back up statements being made? Literature is used to make a number of points. An attempt is made to find answers in the literature. However, each citation is not really explored or interpreted by the student. To what extent is it reflective? There is some reflections on the part of the student and answers from the literature are used to confirm these feelings. You shouldn't use it to confirm, by the way, exactly because you do not go far enough trying to explain, justify these feelings. And fourth, to what extent is it analytical and critical? There's an attempt to analyze the topic, but this is not done in great depth. So if, if this is your type of writing, this is the type of feedback you get to the writing. Let's go to another example out of three from the University of Leicester, which goes, there are a number of inherent methodological difficulties in evaluating treatment efficacy in this area, and this has contributed to controversy within the research literature surrounding treatment outcomes for this group of offenders. Firstly, while well, there's no doubt that's a primary problem. So it's the same example that we have been reading through before, and now let's look into how well is the argument coming together. Now, you see a number of purpose lines. I used color code for it. This writing shows you what it is about. It shows you where the writing is coming from. And it shows you what is looked at and what can be observed. So this is a good introductory part based upon which a more in-depth analysis can be conducted because you provide here the framing. You say, okay, this is what I want to do, why I want to do it, this is where I'm coming from, and this is the data set that I take into my analytics. And now the next step would be to provide the analytics. Okay? So this is an advanced level of analysis. It's a good framing. Um, this is something for you to orient yourself. And this now is a third example. This is something you might want to aim for. This is like journal level quality. And you see it already in the level of detail, starting right away from the title. And you can take a look at it afterwards in detail. Let's now go already into the criterion on how this work was evaluated. Now, title and bio graphic details of the text, yes, very much in place. Introduction, where do I even coming from? Yes, using Hofthilders, okay. So this is how you ground your work. Reporting work, yes, what has been done already, good when conducted a study. Presents the aim and purpose of the article and key finding, this research aimed to, okay. You see, those are all phrases that can be trained. And the structure of an argument is a structure of an argument is a structure of an argument. You might have it in a journal in a more in-depth way than you have it in a thesis where it builds up over more pages. Um, but structure-wise and purpose-wise, there's the same flow, right? So this is something that can be trained and should be trained. Sentence seems focus on the text. We're here at five now. The study reveals that, great. 
six transitional signals provide structure and coherence. Yes, you take the reader by hand with words indicating, however, the result of the other. So this is your job as a writer, right? You take the reader by hand. Review assessment point seven to the extent that this research is so you're very critical. You show limitations of the work. Now, not only is this to be expectable at the journal level, but also in the abstract of your thesis. Ideally, you will hit that level of detail. Then point eight, conclusion summarize, review your judgment. In summary, it has to be admitted. So there's a lot of consideration given and it will have taken a long time to craft all of that piece. So yeah, this is what you perhaps should strive for, also understanding that this level of detail or this level of maturity for doctoral thesis might be beyond what can be achieved. Nevertheless, understanding good practice allows you to orient yourself at it. Good. With this, we come to the closing part and we go off the record to allow off record time for any questions that you might still have. So let me stop the recording.